So the fundamental accounting principle is that if we have one thing that we can do n different ways and we have another thing that we can do m different ways, then the two things can be done in n times m different ways. Now let's see an example. Say we have three shirts and four pairs of shoes. So in how many ways can we put on these things? So in how many ways can we dress when, when we're only looking at shirts and shoes? Let's say the three shirts, we're going to label them. They both start with an S, so that's kind of troubling. Let's say that's X1, X2, and X3. Then you have a little number down below, it's called the index. And then let's say this is Y1, Y2, Y3, and Y4. So then an outfit is uh, different if it's not exactly identical. So maybe the shoes are the same, but not the shirts, then they are different. So if you want to systematically list that, let's say we, we go with shirt X1. And then what can happen with the shoes? We can select Y1 or Y2 or Y3 or Y4. So then we exhausted all the cases that had X1 for shirt. So let's move on X2. Again, nothing stops us from having these four choices again. Right? So we already have one, two, three, four, eight cases. And we're going to have four more because in case we select the shirt that is X3, we still have the same four choices for shoes. So we have three times four, which is 12 outcomes. It is necessary that the second choice is independent from this first choice, but just as a basic fundamental thing. And there are other ways to represent this, and some of those are very useful. So I want to show you the tree. So first, we choose one shirt out of the three. We can choose X1, or X2, or X3. So this here is the first choice. And then no matter what we did with the shirts, we have four choices for shoes. We have Y1, Y2, Y3, Y4, and then same again. Y1, Y2, Y3, Y4, and again the same one. And this here is the second choice. And the 12 outcomes are here. Now what would this outcome be? Start at the root of the tree and read it out, and that's the choice. So for shirt, it's X3, for shoe, it's Y2. So this end here represents the outcome X3, Y2. This should be X1, Y1, right? And so we have 4 plus 4 plus 4, that is our 12 outcomes. Okay, the last time we had a counting problem where we had uh, 2, 5, and 8, and we were interested in how many three-digit numbers can be formed. Now we're going to apply the fundamental counting principle. And here is another very typical combinatorial method. Instead of counting how many are there, we're just going to pretend to generate one outcome and we carefully watch how many choices we had along the way when we generated that one. So imagine that we are about to generate a three-digit number. How many choices do we have for the first digit? Well, we can use two or five or eight. That's three choices. How many choices do we have for the second digit? Well, completely independent of the first, we have all three choices again because repetition of digits is allowed. If you're not sure, ask yourself, is 255 a three-digit number? Yes, it is. So we have three options uh, to fill out the second slot, and we have three options to fill out the third one. And because these choices are independent of each other, the total number of outcomes is 3 times 3 times 3, which is 27. Now, suppose we have 258, the same three digits, and now... So we have the same question, but now repetition of digits is not allowed. Again, this, this was a problem that we have done using systematic listening in a previous video. So, this is where it gets interesting, because we have three options for the first digit, but not for the second one, right? We don't know what we selected. If we selected a 2, we can choose from 5 and 8, but 2 is out of the question, because repetition is not allowed. If this first digit was selected to be 8, then we have 2 and 5 to choose here from. And so, what is very nice here is that the second choice is not quite independent from the first, but the number of choices is still independent. So no matter what digit we selected for the first one, we're going to still have two options. And finally down to one option. So there is just going to be this six. So now we're given six digits. And we have to 
count the number of three, di three digit numbers that can be formed using these numbers. And then the second question, the same, but no repetition of digits is allowed. So you kind of have to have trust that if, they ins if, if the problem is this, that you should list, it's not going to be thousands. But this problem is not asking for listing, so be careful because sometimes it might be a whole lot of things that still shouldn't stop you from starting to list because that's how you get the idea of what we are multiplying by what. But at this point, let's just apply the fundamental, fundamental counting principle. How many choices do we have for the first digit? Well, we can choose any of the six. What about the second one? Same story. Third one, same story. So we have six choices for the first digit, six from the second, and six from the third, and that's going to be six to the third power, or 216. The same question, see one thing about combinatorics is that there is not a whole lot of computation. It's basically just, uh, just an idea and then a short little computation. So the second one, if we are not allowed, so this is, a, what, this is one, if we are not allowed to repeat digits, then we have six options for the first one, but now we are down to five with the second one, and then four for the third one, 120. Now here's the main question. Well, it's not going to be mean once I give it away. So how about how many three-digit numbers can be formed using these six digits where at least one digit is repeated? So I'll write it down. Did I, have, did I mention that sometimes you don't know walking into a problem whether it's going to be a difficult one or an easy one? If we want to do a straightforward count, it would be pretty daunting. It's probably doable because three digits is not that many, but we would have to get organized and systematic now, how many times do we repeat a digit? Two times or three times? And then what digits do we repeat? The trick is that there are only two cases possible. Either, either something is repeated or nothing is repeated. So what I'm trying to say is that the best way to find this answer is to find these two and subtract. These are the cases where all three digits are different. So everything else will have to have some sort of a repetition. So the best way to do this is we, we go 216 minus 120, which is 96. Yeah, 96 doesn't sound so bad to count. It's, even if you list it, it's, it's maybe half a page, right? But this is, this is a mean question, unless I ask you first the first and the second. Then I'm sort of holding your hand um, in, in, in how to build up. So this is a mean question to ask. It's much kinder if I ask you first these two because I'm sort of holding your hand and leading you towards the best solution. So let us right now agree that in this class, 015 is not a three-digit number. It's 15, which is a two-digit number. In other words, in our class, no integer will start with a zero. Well, other than zero. So how many digits are there? We are no longer given a list of digits. That means that whatever is out there, we can use. So that's 1 through 9, that's 9, and the 10th one is 0, right? Yeah, that's 10. Okay, so how many choices do we have for the first digit? And because we agreed that we're not starting with 0, all the other 9 can, can play, but 0 is out of the question. So the first digit can be 9 different ones. How about the second digit? Right there, we have 10 choices. And then the next one, we also have 10 choices. And the next one, we also have 10 choices. So it looks like there are 9,000 four-digit numbers. Okay, now the same question, you guessed it, no repetition of digits is allowed. And this is where it gets interesting. So for the first digit, we have nine choices. Now, for the second digit, we have nine choices again, because if we picked seven here, we lost seven as an option here, but we gain zero, right? We lose one, we gain some. We lose one, we gain one. So we have again, have nine options. It's basically all 10 of the digits except for whatever we picked first. And then the next one, now we cannot use whatever was here and whatever is here. So now, now we're down to eight and seven. So this is sort of interesting. And the hardest question would be, how many four digit numbers where there is some repetition of digits? Maybe a whole lot or just one. And the answer would be, you have to subtract these two. These are all the ones with all four digits are different. So all the rest of the 9,000 must have some sort of a repetition. Suppose we have 10 students, they compete and we record all 10 places. So from the first place to the 10th place, how many possible outcome is there? Okay. So again, let's imagine that we decide who, who is going to be the first place. If it was our choice. Um, 
how many students <coughs> can, can we select for the first place? Well, the answer is 10. How many for the second? Well, there is no student who, who could win first and second place. Therefore, here, repetition of students is not allowed. Everyone just gets one rank, ranking. So, for the second place, we have nine options, and then eight, and then seven, and then six, and then five, and then four, and then three, and then two, and imagine that whenever we pick the student, um, it's like picking in a picking a team. They come and stand behind us. So we picked the first kid. This is standing behind us. There is nine waiting to be picked. Then we pick. Then we ha have um, we, we have nine choices. We pick one out of the nine. We are down to eight. So this is just one person standing there, and we have the one choice, one one possible uh, candidate for the tenth place. Now, this is a pretty big number, and this comes up a lot in combinatorics and in other places too. You will see that uh, you might see, if you change your mind about mathematics, you might see that this comes up a whole lot. So, because that happens, we have a notation for it, and it goes like this, and it's uh, pronounced 10 factorial. And this thing comes up in probability a lot. So with this calculator, everything uh, we enter in the same order we would say or write those things. So 10 factorial, so we go 10, and now we have to find a factorial. Look for a button that says PRB, that's for probability, it's right here. So when we press that, it shows three things, but look at the third one. The third one is uh, factorial, so with the arrow we toggle under it and we select it by pushing enter and it says 10 factorial and we say yes by pushing it's a pretty big number um, what is that it's 3,628,800 that would not be fun to be listed that would not be fun to list so this is that's why sometimes we just prefer this notation. So it's 3,628,800. That's a lot of outcomes. Now, if I ask you, suppose we, we have 10 objects, how many different ways uh, can, can it be arranged? That is the same question as this. Because we have 10 objects, and what do I put in the first place? What do I put in the second place, third place, and so on? So. If we have n objects, and by the way, I don't know if you recognize it, but in our first combinatorics video, we listed a whole bunch of questions. This is the one with the 20 letters. So if we have 20 envelopes, and say we number them from 1 to 20, and we have 20 letters, how many different ways can we stuff the letters into the envelope, provided that one, one letter goes into one envelope? Then, if I grab the first letter, how many place, uh, how many envelope do I have to choose for? From 20. Then for the second one, it's going to be 19, 18, all the way to 2 times 1. So it is 20 factorial, the answer with the, with the letter. So we have 20 envelopes, 20 letters. How many different ways can we stuff the letters into the envelope? That might be too big of a number to e either show, let's say, 20, probability, toggle on the... Any factorial, yep, it is scientific notation. So it says 2.43 and multiply it by 10 to the 18th power, 18 or 16. So the number of ways we can reorder n many objects is called the permutation, and it is n factorial. Well, actually, here are two problems that are somewhat similar. Let's start with the second one. So we have 10 students, and how many outcomes, say we have 10 students who are competing, how many outcomes are possible for first, second, and third place? Well, for the first place, we have 10 students possible. For the second one, well, the one who got first place is out of question, so we have nine left. And for the third place, the first and the second place are out of question, so we have eight left. So that's 720 outcomes. And this first one, it sa says, okay, there are 10 students, and we want from 1st to 10th, which means that the first for the first one we have 10 options, for the second one we have 9, and so on, and all the way down to 2 to 1. 
this is STEM factory. And in my country, this is the only thing that was called a permutation. So you have 10 and you have to pick 10 out of it. But in America, this is called a permutation too. For me, permutation is rearrangement. It's a matter of definitions. I'm not saying better or worse, although I'm thinking it. And there is notation for that. But th in this one, there is just one, one number to, to worry about, and that's 10, right? So, the item, so it's 10 factorial, and that's what we punch into the calculator. We can easily punch this into the calculator, but uh, what I want to point out is that, is that the calculator has a function of it. There are two numbers here to worry about, right? 10 and 3. And so this capital P is for permutations, and this is out of how many, and this is how many we pick. The interesting thing is what things are true independent of labeling, once we agreed what we call what. That's, that's the interesting part of mathematics. This is in your calculator when you uh, push probability. You, took, you see that N, C, R. Usually the convention is that N is the bigger num number. So if we punch in 10, oops, no. So everything in the order, so we punch in 10, then this probability thing, we don't need that, and then 3, that is our 720. So first the big number, then the permutation symbol, and then three. That's that. For a while, I, I will demand that you, you, you just write this much. I mean, this is not, not a whole, whole lot to remember. OK. Is there any questions? Now, just because you know the formulas, that doesn't mean you're not going to have questions where you have to adjust your thinking. Uh, let me give you an example. So say there is a long table. And 10 people can be seated there. Now let's make it 12. So 12 people can be seated. And if 12 people show up, how many different ways can, be, can they be seated? So for the first spot, we can pick 10, 12 people. For the second spot, we can pick 11 all the way. So this is going to be just 12 factorial, which is quite a big number. So it's 479,000,600. That's, that's, a lot of, that's a lot of ways. Okay, now suppose we have the same table and we have 12 people, but now these 12 people are six married couples. How many different ways can they be seated provided that we want married people to sit next to each other? The first thing we have to realize is that next to the, uh, the first and the second have to be married because if you put the first one and then the second and the third married, then uh, there is there's trouble with number one. So basically, so imagine that we are the ones organizing how these people are seated. So first, we are not going to worry about who seats where. Just um, these, these double seats are going to be assigned to married couples. Think of it as benches. So for this bench, we can assign six married couples. For the second one, we have our, our only five left and so on. Four, three, two, one. Yes, this is exactly the same as how many ways can we, can we rearrange six objects. So now, we counted all the ways that the married couple can be assigned to a double seat like that. But now, how do they sit down? There are two options, husband here, wife there, or vice versa. So imagine that we fix everything, and then these two uh, swap places, well, that's, an, that's a multiplier of two. And then the same here. And the same here, and all together we're going to have 6 multiplier of 2. And that reflects the choice of in what order does a married couple. So this is 6 factorial times 2 to the 6th power. And the really hard question would be, is the one where we would have to subtract this from that? What would that be? It would be how many ways can we see 6 married couples so that not all, the, all married couples sit together? enough if just one, one, one pair is broken up. And that, then we would have to subtract this from that. That is going to be a fairly typical trick in combinatorial is that sometimes what we are not interested in is much easier to count. So we count that and subtract. Thank you for watching.